Oh, shit. Welcome to episode 84 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast, joined as always by Mary, a woman who is mentally wearing black and will do her best to try and keep it together during this very emotional episode. I am merely an empty sleeve in a manly face named Darren. <laughs> hey, Mary. <laughs> How are you? Oh my God. That might be your best one yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny how you think of the last second without participating and trying. So anyway, what's going on with you? How are how are things? <laughs> I'm participating. I'm trying. I'm here. I'm here. You always are. Judgmental. Okay. What the fuck? Whoa. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. Well, yeah, that was 30 seconds in with the. You know what you could have done is showed up with like a long sleeves on and your sleeve pinned. Yeah, Very... I know, but it's also a thousand degrees here. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, some things I won't, I won't do. I just, you know. I will do anything, but I will not do that. Wow. Okay. That's good to know. Anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how's the phone? What's going on with you? What's happening? Not much. We are um, almost at vacation time for the both of us, which is really, really nice. Um, oh, we are about to record episode 84, which will be our um, last episode for a few weeks anyway, because we're on going to be on vacation. And I'm really excited to record this one. How are you doing? Yeah, well, I, I'm sure you are. I'm doing okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, the vacation is in the air. It's on the horizon. So mm -hmm. I'm absolutely looking forward to uh, to doing this. We're going to find ourselves down in Virginia, Mary, which is where we're going to be talking about tonight. Not the same battlefield, but the same state, Yeah. right? We're going to be going down there. So today we're going to be talking about, before we do our beers in a second, but before, today we're going to be talking about Seven Pines. So since I didn't forget what you tend to do sometimes, I'm going to simply okay. ask you the question. Okay. Hi, Mary. Um, <laughs> how, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking Good Monster, uh, which is by Collective Arts Brewing, which is one of my favorite breweries from here in Canada. And it actually tastes a lot like Treehouse. It tastes like their Julius. So um, if anybody finds themselves up in Canada and is looking for beer that is similar to Treehouse, head to Collective Arts. And I'm yeah. drinking out of my Joseph E. Johnston mug, um, mm -hmm. which I was like, I finally have a use for that tonight because he's at this Battle of Seven Pines, also known as Fair Oaks. Um, mm -hmm. And what, sir, are you drinking? Well, Mary, thanks for asking. I really appreciate it. Or should I'm I call you governor? Of... Okay, you call whatever you want. I'm drinking Yingling because that's what I have. And out of the company mug, the Civil War Breakfast Club coffee mug. I don't have a Johnston, nor do I have anything else for this thing. So go ahead and laugh at that. I know that's set that one up for you. Anyway, not even an ooh. All right. Okay. I must be losing ooh. my touch. Ooh. All right. I had so beer in saying, my mouth. <laughs> ooh. All right. Well, today <laughs> we are talking the Battle of Seven, Pli uh, Seven Pines or the Battle of Fair Oaks, if you're nasty, okay, depending on whether you wear gray or blue. We'll talk I don't about know why they the just, end. I mean, you could just compromise and call it either, you know, Seven Oaks or Fair Pines. Okay, so anyway, as I was saying, um, this seems like a moderate battle in a lot of different ways, but in the end, it is going to have a landscaping changing effect and a seismic, as they say, effect on the Civil War on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, just to set the timeline real quick here, uh, the battle is going to take place at the end of George McClellan's uh, glacier-like speed peninsula campaign. Um, and it's one that started in mid-March 1862. And by the time they make it to Seven Pines, it'll be late May. And, and this is basically aimed at sacking the rebel capital of Richmond. It's kind of what it is, the grand plan. But by the time they get to late May, and despite being slower to win a playoff series on the Trump Toronto Maple Leafs, Mary... Mac and his happened. huge oh no Mac and his huge army they've got over a hundred thousand men they are so close to Richmond they reportedly could hear the church bells um and really the only thing standing between George McClellan and Richmond is Joseph E Johnston who has over 90,000 men like McClellan Johnston is not exactly going to be confused with being an aggressive guy by any stretch of imagination either so this is going to be an interesting battle because it has all the makings of two generals just staring at each other. Yeah, just going to stare at each other? Just going to stare at each other. <laughs> <all the time? laughs> 
Yeah. And Johnson is the guy that we've talked about him in quite a few episodes already, but they've been episodes towards the end of the civil war, you know, Bentonville, um, the, and the surrender with Sherman and all that. This is a guy that, and we said in our episode about, you know, battle of Bentonville and then the surrender at Bennett place, we said, this was a guy that has been in it from the very beginning. And this is one of those kind of this, these very early battles, like when you think about it, um, you know, the battle of Shiloh has just occurred like what, eight weeks before this battle. It seems like, it seems like these things take so much time in between, but it's not that distant. No, it's, it's right eight weeks. Horizon, right? It's just eight so, weeks. And, you know, and so much happens in that eight weeks without, without getting into to true political dynamic of, of the peninsula campaign. Suffice it to say, Abraham Lincoln, you know, him, the guy with the hat, the president talk up from time to time. The tall man. The tall man. He wants Mac to be more aggressive, obviously. Uh, Mac thinks um, Johnston has more men than he does, which mm-hmm. tr- proves to be false, obviously. Yeah. And especially when you consider the fact that um, he's already expecting Irvin McDowell's first corps, who was defending uh, Washington, to be sent into Virginia for help. So uh, Joseph E. Johnson knows that uh, he has he, that he has fewer men. He knows. And he's left to pick and choose his battles, for lack of a better phrase. He's going to put most of his army south of a river called the Chickahominy, mm-hmm. and they're going to put them behind barricades that, that were built in 1861. So they've been there a little while. The river itself is going to offer a really good natural barrier. It's not a gigantic river like the Potomac, no. but for the time of year in spring, it really flows hard. It, it, it overflows yeah. Um, it turns basically into marshes, swamps that surround it. So it really turns into a very difficult river to cross yep. when you're talking about May. Yeah. And like McClellan is, you know, he's wanting these reinforcements and he's wanting them badly. And he feels that, you know, he knows Lincoln is scared. Lincoln is scared that Washington is going to be overrun. And McClellan, is t- trying to tell him the object of the enemy's movement is probably to prevent reinforcements being sent to me. Uh, there's no threat to you. So just send me my reinforcements. And, you know, he's writing his wife at this time, um, telling him how scared Lincoln is, but you know, McClellan writes her and says like the net is quietly closing and some fish will soon be caught. So he's got the confident McClellan on. He's very different in his letters to her than he is with Washington. And I mean, rightly so. He's not expecting that these letters will ever be read by anybody. Um, no, so no. if you want to true, if you want to see the true McClellan or read these letters that he was writing to his wife, where he's like, oh, he's yeah. like, God, they won't send me my reinforcements, which I understand his frustration. Um, I think he was probably, I, I think he was probably right in saying Washington's not going to th- be threatened. Just send me my, you know, send me McDowell. <laughs> You know, we'll, we'll talk about letters later, specifically yeah. when he writes. But just to finish up this whole river thing, you know, the Chickahominy is going to be tough to cross and because of all the seasonal rain. Yeah. So on May 16th, Joseph Johnston, what he's going to do is he's going to put those men south of it. Like we mentioned, he's going to destroy all the bridges that cross yeah. it, knowing that his army below the river um, is in a pretty good safe space, considering McClellan's force is stuck above it. So. Yeah. The Union, for that matter, they're going to get to a point where they are going to realize these bridges are gone. And McClellan and his men are going to try to rebuild some new ones, uh, namely one called the Bottoms Bridge, uh, which will become the only real route into Richmond for the Army at that point. Yeah. Um, they'll also repair a bridge called the River and York River Railroad Bridge. But by May 20th, the Union troops are going to use those bridges. They're going to begin to move south and cross the bridges over the Chickahominy using two Army Corps, the 4th Corps under Erasmus Keyes we'll talk about, and the 3rd Corps under Samuel Heinzelman. Now, the remaining three corps, uh, three corps, these are the ones under Edward Sumner, um, Fitz John Porter, and William Franklin, they're going to stay north of the river. So you got five corps, three are going to stay north, and two are going to go south, okay? And that's what that's pretty much what they're going to do. So can, can we say he's kind of separate, he's divided his army um, a little bit with this? You should be a detective. <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly what he does oh yeah he's, he's divide is dividing his army which is considered a very risky move right um and you know you know on the confederate side of things you, you have johnson with his right wing commanded by longstreet he's got hill and um ug with him i said it right and his left wing commanded by general gustavus smith who he's got ap hill he's also got magruder with his own division and mclaws is held in a reserve room 
reserve wing at this time. But, you know, as you said that, you know, these bridges that are over the Chickahominy, they have not been built by engineers at all. No, we'll, we'll talk about that. No, yeah. they're going to, he's going to begin to move first and he's going to get his core across those rivers with those, uh, off the, across the river with those bridges we talked about. And he's going to move down a road called the Williamsburg Road. Now on May 26th, heavy rains are going to hit again and they're going to slow both armies. And those spring rains are just going to continue to drench the area. Now, Leading those Union men will be troops in the 3rd Division of the 4th Corps under the name of Silas Casey. And of mm -hmm. course, Mary, he's a New Englander, okay? Yep. And we'll talk a little bit about him real quick, Mary. Okay, I know you have some background as well, but yep. he was born in July 12, 1807, East Greenwich, Rhode Island. Um, like many of his peers, he attended West Point, finished near the bottom of his class, just like you, Mary, 39th out of 41. Okay. In the class of 1826, he was the classmate of Samuel Heinzelman, who mm -hmm. we'll be talking about soon, yep. um, as well as guess who? Albert Sidney Johnson. Yep. Now, Casey's going to go on to fight Mexico. He'll be wounded at the Battle of Chapultepec in 1847. Now, this is what's fun about him, okay? 1859, okay, he's going to participate in the infamous Pig War in San Juan, wow. island of the Pacific Northwest, uh, where he's going to command a uh, picket camp. The Pig War, I know you're thinking, what was the Pig War, was a dispute between the state of Washington and British Columbia. You damn Canadians, okay? Yep, here um, we are over, again. Right, over territory. Now, yep. it's called the Pig War because an American farmer's crops happened to be eaten by a local Canadian pig, <laughs> and the American shot the pig, and it caused an international <laughs> incident. That is so you can't make this stuff up. That's the so US bad. Mil the U.S. military is going to intervene in this, okay, to protect the farmer from being uh, being arrested. Casey finds himself up there defending this guy with old friend George Pickett, of all people, is up there with him at the pig war, okay? Oh, my God. And later now, on, Pickett's going to go to Canada. Yeah. Is this why they call it Canadian bacon? And so as, as I was saying, Mary, ne ne needless to say, the war ended up with no casualties. I mean, it's Canada. I mean, they're going to say sorry and apologize. Nothing's going to happen. But um, <laughs> General Winfield Scott is going to end up negotiating this peace settlement with uh, British Columbia, a governor named Governor Douglas. Now, um, you know, and we'll just, you know, and we talk about it. We're talking, you know, Canadian pigs and all kinds of fun stuff. But, <laughs> But Casey is going to join the 9th U.S. Infantry as a lieutenant colonel. He's going to get his star, becoming a Brigadier General Volunteers in August of 1861. Now, he's going to rise in command pretty quickly. He's going to get division under Erasmus Keys, we talked about, where he's going to find himself here now at Seven Pines. So, yeah. fun fact, by the way, Mary, about him, he was part of the court-martial. He was part of the committee that found out that Fitz John Porter guilty of cowardice after Second Manassas. So, yep. these guys all kind of... I may not know who these people are by, by front, you know, kitchen table talk, but they all kind of all kind of work their way in. Anyway, well, let's talk about Canadian pigs, not named Kim Cottrell. <laughs> Perfect. I, I just somehow wonder if that's the origin of Canadian bacon, this pig war thing. Um, but um, his manual, Casey's manual on infantry tactics was adopted by the Union Army. He starts off as a drill master in the Army of the Potomac. Um, but his division uh, going into Seven Pines does not have a great reputation. These are men that are, you know, relatively new to battle. They haven't really seen much. But uh, a notable Washingtonian female said of them, Casey's troops were notorious here this whole past winter for bad discipline and bad conduct in every way. So I would imagine they were visiting the bang barns and such in Washington, D.C. and all that. And at the time of the Battle of Seven Pines, two thirds of his regiments and their officers were new. And they are basically this kind of, you know, McClellan has been like, you go right to the front. You newbies were just like well, trial, that's, that's trial by fire, right? I mean, it was still it was still new in the war for the most part. But yeah, you know, yeah. Casey in his division, you know, they're going to move slowly uh, down that rain slog Williamsburg Road, and they're going to arrive in a small crossroads town called Seven Pines. Now, uh, they'll end up setting up this huge camp there at the site of these two twin houses that were supposed to be part of a mansion that was to be completed and never got done. Okay, was for it the twin reason. pine houses? It was three pine originally, and then part of the fly <laughs> But that's another story for this. Now it's two now. But you know, near, near you know, near these houses was a hundred foot long wood pile that stood ten feet high. So Casey determines that this is probably a good place to set up that set up his division and set up a defense. He's immediately going to have his men start cutting down trees and start building abatis. Now, one is going to be about a half a mile west of those twin houses, 
another is um, that's going to be crossing the Williamsburg Road. And the other is going to be about a quarter mile east of these houses. And what's going to happen is we're going to put all the tents in the middle. And just to the west of the tents, Casey is going to build this five-sided monstrosity called Casey's Redoubt. Which is going to be kind of a kind of like a little mini fortress. Mm -hmm. And they built these things pretty quickly and in the rain, in the mud, which is pretty impressive. Behind Casey's division is going to be the fourth corps and division under Darius Couch, we're going to talk about. Yep. And behind them is going to be the troops from Samuel Heinzelman's third corps. So they're all kind of coming slowly. Again, we got to talk about the weather on this because yeah. um, you know, it's it's going to be an issue. Uh, this camp that Casey's going to build. For the most part, it's 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 kind of defended on three sides by natural barriers. But unfortunately, it's got things like the White Oak Swamp. The swamp is going to cross it yeah. on one side. But it's going to unfortunately part of the camp is going to be exposed and unprotected um, by any natural barriers. The point of the Fourth Corps commander Erasmus Keys is going to say, and his quote is, "Our camp was certain to tempt the enemy to attack us." So they set up this yeah. area they think is pretty defensive, but they realize. Oh shoot! We've got to put a door in this wall. Hope no one comes through it. Yeah, and that's kind of how this whole thing kind of slowly gets going. Well, even Couch remarks that the position is not great at all either. And you know, leading into all this, um, you know, the the Union Army um, Balloon Corps is with the Army of the Potomac at this time, so they're able to do a little bit of, you know, re reconnaissance for them. And they're commanded by uh, Professor Thaddeus Lowe. And there's two balloon camps that are north on the north side of the river, so Gaines Farm and Mechanicsville. And Low reports a buildup of troops on May 29th for the Confederates that there's they're building up in front of Fair Oaks train station. Uh -huh. And he he reports this back to to McClellan. And at this time too, um, McClellan is has actually become bedridden because he's had a flare up of malaria, which he apparently contracted when he was in Mexico. So Probably he's not Canadian Canadian pigs probably from Canadian pigs. I don't know how that would happen in Mexico, but <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird, weird world, Mary. Um, he, and you know, he wrote his wife and he said, I have been troubled by the old Mexican complaint brought on by, I suppose, exposure to the wet, etc." which I mean, it had been really rainy. Um, but he does remark that my men are in such excellent condition and such good spirits that I cannot doubt the results. I feel we must beat the rebels and I hope to end the war. My camp is about four and a half miles from Richmond. I fancy secesh is becoming rather disrupted. And then he also says to her, I could not help laughing this afternoon when I received from the Secretary of War a copy of dispatch from McDowell, which proves them all to have such a pre precious lot of fools that and that I have been right all the time. Oh, I don't know. Sounds like some I okay. know. You know? <gasps> but we got to talk real quick about these bridges, though. Can we just yep. talk about a little bit ago? Because it's going to be important. You know, uh, going back to Keys again. You know, he's going to be he's going to be busy, you know, for the most part, having his men trying to build these additional bridges. Like you mentioned before, they don't have any engineers. This Chickahominy is a real friggin mess and there's water spilling on both sides and they can't they can't corduroy the roads because the logs are sinking. It's a big mess. They don't have a lot of supplies. Uh, and when you couple that with the net endless rain, um, the whole area is just like a mud marsh. It's going to be a complete disaster. Um, and things aren't going to work too well. So they're going to have guys like the first Minnesota, these lumberjack dudes trying to fix these bridges. Now, this is not going to be an OSHA approved situation here with these bridges. They're going to hey, be but those dangerous. lumberjacks are basically like Canadians. They can do anything. Oh, well, they probably can. They probably can. They're going to try to build some bridges and it's going to work. Okay. Um, and what they do is they end up with, with, they end up building these little things. The grapevine bridge we'll talk about that. You look at that and go, I ain't crossing that, but they kind of have to. So yep. On or about May 25th now, Joseph E. Johnson is going to get wind that the Union Army is now divided. He finds out, okay, that three of those corps we talked about are north of the river and two are south of it. And he feels that we may have an opportunity here. Okay, that's what he's <laughs> thinking. So the normally passive Joseph Johnston decides, you know, this is probably a good time to attack now. And he blows that conch shell and he starts bringing in troops from Fredericksburg and, and outside of Petersburg. He's going to have about 75,000 guys yep. is what he's going to have. Uh, those men, guys you talked about, he has three division commanders to work with, James Longstreet, D.A. Chill, and Gustavo Smith. And what he wants to do is he wants to attack McClellan's both divided sets of corps. More importantly, what you hinted at earlier, he wants to attack them quick 
because he knows Irvin McDowell's core is coming and he wants to hit them before they get there. Yeah. Now, while this is all going on now, uh, a couple of days later, the 27th, 28th, somewhere around there, Johnson's going to find out he's going to get some intelligence from a cavalry guy named Jeb Stewart. Here's Jeb again, right? Oh, there he is. He, he, Jeb's going to tell McDowell some important piece of information. Primarily, Irvin McDowell's men aren't coming after all. They've been rerouted to the Shenandoah Valley to go chase down Stonewall Jackson. Okay. Yep. So I'll, Johnson probably let out a big sigh of relief. He's like, okay, cool. I have a little bit of time. So he's going to redo his plan. He's going to focus now on just those two core that are currently south of the Chickahominy near Seven Pines and near Fair Oaks. Okay. And then after he finishes off these two, he's then going to aim north and he's going to take out the other three. So he got, Johnson actually goes up with a pretty good plan. Like it this, is a okay? really good plan. It, it does. Now it's going to fall apart for a couple of reasons. Okay. Yes. The, the primary reason is he never, he tells, he tells James Longstreet the plan. He tells him, he doesn't write it down. Exactly. This is one of those instances where you're verbally talking to somebody about this huge project you have at work. And it clearly is one of those instances where you know, wow, this should have been an email kind of thing. It well, exactly. usually is the opposite. Like, wow, that meeting could have been an email. This is one of those things where it's like, wow, that should have been an email. Now, when you and when we when we go to the details of this plan, it's very complicated. It's based heavily on timing and logistics. Yeah. Okay. The, so he screws there's two mistakes. One, he does it verbally, doesn't write it down. Yeah. Two, he gives it to Longstreet, who naturally misinterprets it. Naturally, okay. Right. So Anyway, here's how it's supposed to go. Here's how the things are supposed to go down. Johnston is going to divide his own army, okay, as well. He's going to have divisions under A.P. Hill and John Magruder. are going to head north across the Chickahominy River to protect his army and keep those three remaining Union Corps, for the most part, there. Try to pin them, at least slow them from reinforcing. Just not, not going to attack them. They're just going to be there just so they don't keep them from coming down while they're attacking the other two. Johnston knew he was facing about 30,000 guys and Union troops that were around the Seven Pines, Fair Oaks area. And he knew there were two corps. He knew there was the third under Heinzelman and the fourth under Keyes. Um, these are going to be the focal point of the attack, these, these, two, key, these two people. Longstreet's going to have about 40,000 guys under his overall command, and he will have them approach. The, this is the plan now. This is not Longstreet. This is Johnston's yep. plan. The plan is Longstreet's going to take us 40,000 guys. He's going to have them approach the Federals from three different roads. They're all going to hit at the same time, okay? The key to this plan, again, is timing, okay? you got to have it, okay? Hill's division, this is D.H. Hill, okay, will head down the road called the Williamsburg Old Stage Road um, east from Richmond to Seven Pines, which is the most direct route. And his job was to hit the Union Center. So that's his job. He's got his job. You have one job, okay? Yep. That's what his job is. Benjamin Yuji, okay, his division is going to go up the road called the Charles City, uh, Charles City Road, and he's going to attack the Union left flank, okay? Longstreet, and this is where it's important because Longstreet's role is the one that he screws up. Longstreet is going to go, is supposed to travel up the nine mile road, which is the name of the road, and hit the Union right as well as cover potential retreat paths and block the road from reinforcements from coming from the north, okay? Behind Longstreet, it's going to be William H.C. Whiting. Um, he's a, he, like I said, he's got 40,000 guys. The key to this entire attack is Yuji, okay? Because mm -hmm. once he gets into position, Yuji is supposed to message D.H. Hill, and, who will open the attack on the Union Center. And then upon hearing the sounds of Hill's guns, Longstreet and his men, followed by Whiting, are going to move in on that Union right while Yuji completes that trap and hits the Union left. You got it? It sounds absolutely perfect on paper. It does, okay. It does, it's kind of like the battle, like, I mean, the, the plan that, you know, you think the plan that Burnside had for Fredericksburg, you know, had the, you know, you just needed those pontoons to arrive was perfect on paper. But the problem with this one is communication. You know, first of all, he is giving Longstreet orders verbally. And again, it needed to be an email. But the other thing he does with his other commanders is I think he, he does write them down, but he, he like, he vague books it. 
it's like one of those things where like, Oh, I'm having a bad day. And it's, you're like, what, what's going on? You have to kind of interpret what's going on. So his orders given to the rest of his generals are vague. They have contradictions. And then Johnson does not tell his division commanders that Longstreet was in tactical command south of the river. And the shitty thing about that is UG and Smith outrank Longstreet. Well, but there's, there's all kinds of things. It's like there's and all so- like this is like it's like a clusterfuck from the beginning. Yeah. And it's got some parallels, I think, w- with Chickamauga, too, which D.H. Hill and Longstreet are both going to be at that battle. And that's one where they were told, uh-huh. like, you know, wait for the sounds of the weapons to start the battle. And like yeah. that was all about miscommunication as well. Yeah. Very similar. So, like, there's a lot of parallels with that one too. So, so May 30th is the day before this whole ball gets going. Here, Longstreet and Johnson are going to meet to discuss this plan. Okay, Johnson again gives Longstreet these orders verbally, and neither Longstreet doesn't write it down, and there's nothing handed to Longstreet. I just Longstreet, imagine them meeting by the water cooler at work. Well, Longstreet, you know, by all accounts, he nodded in agreement. Yep, I got it. Yep. I got it. And he must have been daydreaming. Who the hell knows what he was thinking about? He didn't, he didn't get it. So, you know, so for the first thing is Yuji, like you just said, ne- is never told his role. And he, he's the key to the whole thing. He doesn't yeah. find out. The only orders that Yuji gets at any point of this are from Johnston, who actually sends him a message. And it only says, be ready if an action should begin on your left to fall upon the enemy's left flank. Like, okay. And that's why I say vague, vague book define action like what he gets he gets a fortune cookie message that's what <laughs> that's he got okay it. Like, i would oh, be like def- the, define the device. action device. so the miscommunication they're going to find out the hard way that next day so on the night of may 30th the night for the attack this heavy rain is going to continue and fall in a water level the check check harmony is still is still really really high now about 11 p.m um you know, there are members of the 33 New York who are standing there. Some of them guys get washed. They, 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 the only reason they don't drown is they're holding on to trees. That's how bad the water is yeah. okay, along these bridges. Now, yeah. and this is the situation now where this attack is supposed to start early the next morning. So the stage is set now for Johnston in his Department of Northern Virginia to launch what is going to be the bloodiest battle in the Eastern Theater up to this date, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, early in the morning of May 30th, 1862, Longstreet and his 40,000 guys will be awake and ready to go. Now, they're all spread out. Okay, they're all spread out. Longstreet, per Johnston, okay, is to begin to move down the nine mile, the nine mile road. That's his job. Guess what happens? Longstreet goes down the wrong road. Sound familiar? Okay. Yep. He takes the wrong road. Instead of the nine mile road, he moves down the Williamsburg stage road. And he doesn't tell Johnston. No. Nope. Now, don't forget, there's other guys coming down this road, okay? Yeah. may not seem like a big deal, but when your entire attack is based on logistics and timing, something like this is going to end up, you know, it's, it's going to screw up the blizzard machine, Mary. Okay? It's going <laughs> exactly. To, <right? laughs> By moving down the Williamsburg Old Stage Road, it throws off everything from the beginning. From the beginning. Now, Whiting is confused because he's supposed to follow Longstreet. He doesn't know where he's supposed to go, Okay. He tries to find a senior officer, okay, and he can't find anybody. So he's going to message Johnson directly and say, hey, boss, um, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing here today. And Johnson's Johnson, like, I don't know. Johnson writes back. You know what he writes? Longstreet will precede you. And what? Okay. <laughs> Johnson's like, like, I don't know. Basically, I don't know where he is. So, so Whiting just he had a WTF moment that we all have, especially at work. He's going to take a, he's going to jump in his little car and drive up and see Johnston <laughs> personally. He, he wants to go to his headquarters and see what this deal is because he has no idea what he's supposed to be doing. And when he gets there, he is stunned to find out that nobody there knows what's happening. Johnston is under the impression that Longstreet is moving up the nine mile road at this point as ordered, which of course he's not. Now, Longstreet's going to, I mean, when he realizes that Johnson's going to realize Longstreet is, isn't doing it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to be surprised um, when he's, there's no one on the Nine Mile Road and yep. that everything is stalled now on this Williamsburg Old Stage Road because there's a million troops there and it's rainy and muddy, right? Yuji, you know, he does move up from Charles City Road. He does, he does move up because that's the most direct road from Richmond where he is. 
but he has to stop now because he has to wait because he's stuck behind other troops now. And for that reason, Yuji isn't going to really get there until about 11 o'clock in the morning, hours later than after it's planned. And again, this battle is all, is all contingent on Yuji being in position early. And because of John's vague verbal orders, this battle screwed up. So it's a complete freaking disaster. I mean, it's, 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 it's terrible. I mean, you know. Oh, it's, it, it's a clusterfuck from the beginning with this. And you know, the battle doesn't actually start until about one o'clock in the afternoon. Well, it doesn't, doesn't but it? you know, and the, and the union guys don't really have an idea what's going on either. I mean, no, they're sitting, they're sitting in this wet camp, and yeah. at these at Casey's camp at Seven Pines, the Federals are completely soaked. The trenches around the Abatees and Casey's redoubts are full of water and flooded. Everything's mud. The men are miserable and drenched. One Union soldier is going to write. The unfinished rifle pits were filled, and every depression in the roads and elsewhere had become tiny lakes. Okay. Casey does something smart here. You know what he does? They're all sitting around bitching. He puts them to work. He's nice. Like, you know what? Let's, That's he's, what you let's. do. So he has them begin cutting down trees again just to keep your freaking busy. Go get grab, go grab a broom. Do something. Just stop your bitch. Go sweep. Go sweep. He's doing it. He's doing it to keep their minds off of this. Now, yep. about nine o'clock in the morning, okay, uh, members of the 100th New York who are just sitting on the picket duty. They're going to see one of, this is how screwed up this is. They're going to see one of Joseph Johnson's staff officers come riding into the picket line, right into him, okay? He's going to get captured, but he's not going to give up any information. I'm not doing anything. Yeah. Nothing, it wasn't me. You know? Casey's spidey sense starts to tingle at this moment, okay? Yeah. He's thinking something might be up, and that the Rebs might be up to something, so he's going to pass on this information hey we just caught a staffer cruising through our you know our lines and he's not in a uniform i'm afraid i have to be hanged okay <laughs> and he's going to go to his boss as keys he's going to tell him what's going on not long later there are going to be other pickups on the 85th pa under a guy named captain simon townsend he's going to report rebel activity in his front too so now Casey is going to order the 103rd PA under a guy named Major A.W. Gasm. There's a name for you, okay? Oh, my and God. Hen- I and, so and, uh, want to- <laughs> Yeah. And Henry West, he's in Henry Wessel's 2nd Brigade to reinforce these pickets along this Williamsburg Old Stage Road. So he's like, okay, you know what? Something's up. We need to, we need to strengthen up. So by 9.30 in the morning now, Gasm um, is doing what <laughs> – is doing um is doing this when D.H. Hill's division is going to start to attack that yeah. initial vanguard under a guy named Samuel Garland. This is guys from North Carolina, yeah. Florida, Virginia. They are led by the Second Mississippi Battalion under John Tyler, uh, John Taylor. Okay, so they're all going to hit this wet and tired picket line along the Williamsburg Old Stage Road, and they're going to get hit pretty hard initially. At least mm-hmm. you know, so that right, right off the bat. This is how this thing's going to start for both, yeah. both sides. And the 103rd, you know, the the 103rd Pennsylvania, they they haven't even been in the army for a month. Like these are super green troops, right? And Casey says they broke to the rear and could and could not be brought back into the fight. Which I mean, God, you put your greenest troops at the front, right? Um, and this well, leads, they're, they're, all num- they're all number four to one. They they're are, and this two. leads everything to a complete breakdown at this point this early in the battle and everybody is running towards that second line um towards keys right and like hills men are just they're dominating them well Gar- those, Gar- garland's guys are gonna basically they're gonna first they're, they're gonna get through that abatis they're gonna yeah. climb over that and they're gonna just picture those, those obstacle courses and they're climbing those things they're gonna get around them they're gonna get rid of that over that first set now, Casey's guys are all falling back towards that redoubt, okay? Casey's going to prepare his six regiments from Henry Nagley's 1st Brigade and in this Palmer's 3rd Brigade, along with a battery from Company H from the 1st New York Light Artillery under John, uh, John Joseph Spratt, okay? This battle line will be set up about 200 yards or so behind the abatis that the feds are, uh, that the Rebs are working past. So they try to make it hard for them. So by yeah. 11 o'clock in the morning now, Casey's guys are having some initial success in stalling them. The terrain is tough, and they're putting up a pretty good fight. And 
they're stalling that push by Garland's guys. In this very moment, this is when Yuji and Longstreet's men are supposed to be hitting. Yeah. This is this is the moment, right? Needless to say, uh, they have not even arrived yet on the field. No. And so that three pronged simultaneous attack it ain't, ain't going to happen, right? Which would have been absolutely devastating when you think about it if it had happened. Like if they would have walked right through them. They, 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 they exactly. And they're already getting mowed over enough. Yeah during this right like these are again they're, they're green troops and they're just like meant to be kind of this they're more of like a really cool. strong picket line dh hill knows that he needs more guys okay so yes. he's going to call up the brigades of robert rhodes okay yep. and gabriel reigns they're going to be pulled he's going to call them up rhodes is going to attack from the south on casey's left okay just imagine this um while reigns is north carolina guys are going to get around on casey's left flank Okay. Mm -hmm. Now Hill, his other brigades that are George A. Anderson, not to be confused with GT Anderson, Mary, because <laughs> many of George Anderson. Okay. Yep. Anderson's going to move around Casey's right. So you got Anderson going around Casey's right. Yep. You're going to have Rhodes going on his left while Reigns is going to be getting around his left flank. Okay. So they're trying to get around all of them. Now, what you have at this moment is 6,500 revs that are pushing on three different sides against 3,500 guys in Casey's yep. division. And they're being pushed by the center, the left, and the right. Now, D.H. Hill is going to personally lead the battery. This is Thomas Carter's famous Virginia battery he's going to be leading, right? So by noontime, by, uh, by lunchtime, Casey's going to order his men at this point to fall back into the camp towards that redoubt because there's just too many guys. Yep. And this is the one they built with those wet trenches. So it's kind of like a they're, they're hitting and the union guys are fighting and they're sliding back. They're just slowing them down. Yeah, they're, they're slowing them down. And there had been at one point during the battle where Casey was riding up and down the lines, like, and it, it, this one soldier describes him bareheaded, his long gray hair floating over his shoulders, encourages his, encouraging his men by voice and example to heroic existence. So he's trying to rally his men, at least. He's doing his best, but these revs are coming on fast and furious, yeah. right? Um, yep. Um, Howard, and, and, uh, Howard actually describes the assault in his memoirs that it was so abrupt and overwhelming that, but it's too, it's too, too early for Howard. Oh my God. Sorry. <laughs> well, he, he was saying that the assault was so abrupt and overwhelming that, but little resistance was made by those in advance of the main line and the pickets and regiments just sent forward, leaving the dead and badly wounded were quickly set swept forward by the advancing enemy well, what they did though and this is what you know Casey uh Casey was smart though because what he did is he kind of he had to sacrifice to do something to slow yep. to get most of his guys back especially that battery right yeah he's going to take three regiments the 104th Pennsylvania the 4th Maine um in the 100th New York and what they're going to do is, is they're going to charge these ribs and they're doing this to buy time for the rest of Casey's division and that battery H we we talked about because they yeah. want to get that back now this charge will actually slow dh hill um and silas casey will say after the battle i never saw a handsomer thing in my life um than that charge yeah so they did a pretty good job slowing them down and casey will use this time to put that new line together behind that redoubt while also asking his boss keys um hey by the way can you send me those remaining brigades you have those three from darius couch's first division yep because i could you know not for nothing but i could probably use a little bit of little little, little help little here help. right yep. and couch will actually send some but in the mayhem in the disaster and the road conditions i mean if you get there in time we're going to talk about them coming later okay yeah they're going to get there but it's not going to be too couch soon. doesn't think it's couch kind of thinks it's a too little too late kind of idea I think. Yeah, I mean, he, he probably does. He Because I don't think they understood what was going on. No. Casey's redoubt, I mean, to his credit, is very well defended. He's got six 12-pound Napoleons under George Hart's first now New York Company A, along with the 7th and 8th New York Independent Batteries under Peter Regan and Butler Fitch. Okay, so he's got, he's got, a, he's got some pretty good players on the field. Now, the Rebs are going to have to try to Kool-Aid man it through this first regiment. They're going to have to, right? <laughs> And what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to go under the fourth North Carolina under Brian Grimes. This is from George Anderson's division. Yeah. They're going to fix bayonets. And they're going to charge the redoubt. Okay. They're going to have to. They're going to have some success um, 
but then they're going to run right into the 85th Pennsylvania or Joshua Howell. Yeah. And some of the, some describe Grimes assault as an avalanche. They just kind of went right through them. And, you know, to keep those guns, those, the batteries away from Howell's men, um, you know, the artillerists are going to, are going to basically start to spike the guns. Uh, because uh, once, once the North Carolinians get there and get past these walls, they're, they're going to be in the guns. This is going to end up a gigantic mess for the Union. I mean, the 8th U.S. artillery I mentioned, they're kind of positioned in the wrong place. They're firing in the wrong direction. Some of the shells are exploding over the heads of the 85th Pennsylvania, killing some guys. So you, you can just picture the, the maelstrom of the, the mayhem yep. that's going on. So, so as the day goes up by 2 o'clock, uh, with everything going on, you know, what, where's Joseph E. Johnson all this, Mary? What do you think he, he's doing? He is, he's sitting back at his HQ. He's with uh, Gustavus Smith and um, I believe Robert E. Lee is there too. Well, Lee, Lee's well. going to be, yeah, he's going to sit there gonna, and yeah. this, this is one of those stories again. This, this battle has it all. It's got the weather. It's got the miscommunications. Okay. Um, he can't hear the battle. He's two miles away because of, again, this um, omnipotent acoustic shower yep. always seems to come up. So he's sitting there and he can't hear anything. The wet road is going to slow the messengers down. Um, he has no idea what's going on. The only no. thing he knows at this point, the only thing is that Longstreet took the wrong road and his plan is out the friggin' window. That's all he knows. Yeah. But he, if there was ever a time he wishes he could flip the on-off button on the video game and start over again, this is it, okay? <laughs> I did he that wants, so much. <laughs> he wants a do-over. And he is said to have said in camp, he is said to have said this at, when he was at his headquarters, I wish all the troops were back in camp. So he, right after that, he's like, this is fucking screwed up. This is bad news. And, and, to, and like you mentioned, to add to the flavor of all this, his old 1829 West Point classmate, Robert E. Lee, shows up. And he yep. tells him what piece of information tells him Jefferson Davis is coming. And he's like, well, okay. Nothing like <laughs> the director showing up. So he's like, okay. So by four o'clock now, the winds change direction. Who the hell knows? But they can start to hear the battle now, right? And for the first time, Joseph E. Johnson hears this battle. And I mean, Lee claims I heard it earlier, you know, because he's like, yeah. Robert Lee. But, but in any case, um, it is, you know, oh, exactly. At this moment, to one of Longstreet's aides shows up at the headquarters um, and he requests re reinforcements. He's like, you know, we need some more guys. This is the first official news that Johnson's going to get that a battle is underway is this aid from Longstreet. Yeah. And <laughs> so Johnson, as you can imagine, immediately begins to head down. He's going to go to the battlefield. Yeah. He will actually lead w, uh, William W.C. Whiting's, H.C. Whiting's division himself on a nine-mile road towards mm -hmm. the battlefield. And this is fun, too. As soon as Johnson leaves, Davis is going to show up, okay? Yeah. It's very easy to imagine that Johnson wanted to go before Davis got there. Oh. Had to have. Okay? Oh, absolutely. I would want to get the, I would want a GTFO out like there right away. You know, so he kind of does. So if back at the battlefield, this is around 4 p.m. now, you know, mass hysteria is happening. Casey is trying to hold that line together yep. as D.H. Hill's division is hitting them with everything they got, including guns from cars, Virginia Battery. Yep. Um, just picture rains and roads are hitting their flanks. Um, the, the, you know, everything's kind of caving in. All the while, Casey is, like you said, he's riding, trying to keep this army together. He's just yeah. trying, he's trying to hold back a sandcastle on the beach with a diaper at this point. If you've done it, it's not easy, Mary, okay? <laughs> Clearly what, you've what, done it. <laughs> no, no, no. One Union soldier, he's, he's going to write, old Casey was brave as a lion and remained where he, his men stood. He lost everything but the clothes he stood in. That's what this guy said. Wow. Okay. Now, eventually, again, these numbers start to tell the story as they usually do. In Casey's men in this redoubt are going to start to fall back, and they're going to start mm -hmm. running for their lives. A full OO situation. Okay, they're going to they're going to take full off. What? Okay. No. <gasps> <laughs> so you know, Casey was said said to be retreating, and like you mentioned before, he's hatless, his white hair. He must have a comb over his blowing in the wind as he's running. Well, right? apparently, it was just on his shoulders, so it's kind of oh. slight. Well, they said it was streaming in the wind. It must have been like Fabio. That's right, what I right. thought early. I'm like, what is it? Here's another yeah. one of these Fabio like images from the Civil War. Who else? Like, how many other guys have we talked about where, where that's happening? Well, Barksdale, we talked yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. I was just thinking Barksdale. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
you know, the union is going to lose a cannon to DHL in this. They're going to lose the eight cannon, right? Yeah. Um, but you can imagine how this is going. Casey and his guys are going to fall back. Now, remember, you have, you have the uh, abatees, you got the yep. redoubt, you got the camp, and you got more abatees. Okay, that's kind of how this thing is set up. Casey and his men are going to fall back through the camp now to the eastern abatees, and they're going to try to set up another defensive line. So they're just kind of moving, you know, west to east. It was around now they finally got those reinforcements from Keys and Couch, and they're all going to set up on that, that second line now behind that second abatees, right? This is Sam Heinzelman's third corps. Yep. Um, and he's going to ride with two divisions under Joseph Hooker, okay, the, you know, the, the, our old friend Joe Hooker fighting yep. Joe, and Philip Carney, of all people, Mary. Here now, comes Carney. Yep. Rain's men that were hitting Casey's left flank are going to run into the third brigade of Carney's division that is being led by a Mena named Hiram Barry. We're going to yep. talk about eventually down the road, right? And you can see how this is going. Rhodes men are going to hit Carney's newly arriving right um, in the center of the abatis in this uh, in this hammer that is, is going to be led by the sixth Alabama under the commander John Brown Gordon. Yeah. And we'll talk. You know, you want, you want to talk about him, but the Alabamans they're going to be hit hard. They're going to they're going to be pounded and, yeah. by hitting hitting this middle of the abatis by this Gordon. Yeah, and. Like he, like Gordon describes the fighting at seven pines as some of the bloodiest he had experienced in, in all the civil war. And he says his troops captured the earthworks, but at a very heavy cost. And most of the officers in the six Alabama are going to be killed. Um, at one point, Gordon's men can, could hear the union troops yelling, shoot that man on horseback. And in both armies, um, like Gordon says, it was thought the surest way to demoralize troops was to shoot down the officers. And that's exactly what happens in the Six Alabama is all the officers get shot off their horses. Gordon manages to come away from this part of the battle with only his clothing pierced by several bullets. And what did you say about that regarding karma the other day? Well, I mean, he, he basically cashed in his karma card. <laughs> he cashes right? in his karma card because at this he, battle he, he, because he, he probably is like... You, you come away and you're like, wow, I got bullet holes in my clothes. Oh, my canteen's been pierced. Wow. So I guess that's the worst. But at one point during the battle, Gordon is going to pass by his younger brother, Augustus, who he's only 19 years old at the time of the battle. And this is what Gordon said. He was lying with a number of dead companions around him. He had been shot through the lungs and was bleeding profusely. I did not stop. I could not stop, nor would he permit me to stop. There was no time for that no time for anything except to move on and fire on. Um, and yes, that is an actual quote from his memoirs. There was no time for that, that Gordon could not stop. He, he had, well, he, to, had that, he, he had that, he had that tunnel vision. I mean, that's you know, exactly. John Mark. Now this is the, Gordon, you know, he's going to have his, his issues then T and he's going to get injured. He'll obviously be at Gettysburg. We talk about Gordon, many of these, but you, you can say a lot of things about Gordon, but this, this dude is, this, this guy's a one you know he's he's ready to go his, oh, yeah. his eyes but he ahead. definitely cashes in his karma cash here because of what he happens does. to him after well he's probably thinking he's invincible right yeah. he's probably thinking he's like a you know he's it's he's like, like a stormtrooper wow. shooting at him he's not going to get hit <laughs> right so he's like oh, what's the problem here you know so he, that's probably what it is but the this field they're going to cross is going to be completely muddy some of these guys had to wade up to their shoulders i mean they were yeah. out their knees in the, in the, the muck and the crap um, and you know, some of the injured had to be rescued because when they got shot, they would drown in the mud. They would sink right down because of yeah. how, how high the water level well, was. Because there had been so much, so much rain, right? Again, you should that? be a detective. Fucker. Yes. Rain makes puddles. <laughs> He's going to drown in the puddle. Anyway, I don't want to tease you with this, but, but right, right around this point. Okay. James Longstreet, along with Whiting, are going to arrive on that, ironically, on the nine-mile road, the road that was yep. supposed to come down, okay? Immediately, Longstreet is going to send in James Kemper's brigade to relieve Gordon, and they're going to march right through the remains of that Union camp, but the tents are still set up, and they're going to go right through them. Yep. After the, after the battle, they said some of these tents had 200 bullet holes in them. That's how many were shot at, the, at these guys, okay? And Kemper's Virginians... They're going to get pinned down. They're going to have to fall back after even Gordon. Now, Gordon 6, Alabama, like we said before, they got drilled. 
they lost 59 percent of their men 59 percent that was the highest that was the highest casualty total by a single confederate regiment in the war up to that point 59 percent okay now eventually the, the fire that was coming from these abatis now with the help of carney and hooker's fresh guys they are going to drive these rebel troops back all the way back to Casey's Redoubt, through that camp, back to the Redoubt again. Yep. Robert Rhodes himself is going to be wounded around this time. He's going to get hit um, in the command of this whole brigade. Now is going to fall to Gordon. Yep. So yeah. his, his, he's moving right along. So he takes over. And and Carney, when he comes into this, he's kind of like, I don't know what he's thinking. If he's like Superman of the AOP, but he says he's like, I was again sent for to redeem the blunders and shortcomings of others. Like, well, I mean, he's <laughs> like, what is that? Uh, I don't know, but it, it, as you can imagine, this is this is a big mess. By five p.m. now, this is you know Richard Anderson's brigade. Um, yep. he's in Longstreet's division. We'll start to advance from the Williamsburg Old Stage Road, right down the right end of this Union Abatis. Right, this will be led by Micah Jenkins' guys, and mm. we've talked about some of these guys before. Um, the way they came in, okay, and this is going to set up the second half of this battle. The way they came in, they're going to cut off Darius Couch's men, and the rest of those Union troops are going to be cut off from the rest. So what they did, because of the way they came in the battlefield, they kind of drove a road right through the middle, okay? Mm -hmm. And they split up the army. Couch, realizing this, realizes he needs to get the hell out. He's going to fall back to a place just north called Fair Oaks, okay? Now, with Couch further north, this is going to force Kearney. He's got to shift his position now from that Union left over to the Union right, because he's yeah. going to try to slow down Jenkins' South Carolinians. So you can see how this, how everything's moving, so many moving parts of this, yeah. right? Right now um, is probably around when Joseph E. Johnson shows up at the battlefield, and he's he's going to get there. First thing he's going to do is send in Whiting's division to, mop, in his mind, mop up what's left less of the Federals, Whiting's going to be that final knockout punch. He's going to get his victory. This is how he sees it, okay? Yeah. Now, suddenly on their left at this moment, Union cannon are going to open up on them from Couch's artillery. You mentioned they got those guns over, right? Yeah. Couch was in the process of heading back north over the Chickahominy River because he was looking to get the hell out. When he saw the approach of Whiting's guys, he orders artillery to unlimber and friggin' let them have it, okay? Yep. Kind of what he did. Whiting is going to get pushed. Uh, it's going to get pushed back. Um, you know, two times they're going to try to advance. Two times they're going to get pushed back by Couch's guns. At one point, this is kind of cool. Couch runs out of canister, so yeah. he has the men cut the fuses real short on on these exploding shells. They almost exploded almost immediately coming out of the muzzle and oh created kind of like, created like an impromptu canister, right? And, and as you can imagine, um, it, it, it did its damage. And further south now, D.H. Hill is continuing to do his thing down at Seven Pines. They're going to push back Heinzelman's guys, and they're going to push Keys, both of them, completely off the dance floor out of Seven Pines. They're just, they're just going to get yep. rid of them completely. Um, and as you can imagine, George McClellan, Mary, he's north of the river, and he can start to hear the sounds of the battle now. And he's, and so he's bad gonna, redden too with malaria. He's yeah, he's he ain't, he ain't doing too well. Okay. He hears the battle and he's gonna order the second corps under Edwin Sumner to get ready to go. He's like, you gotta you gotta go, right? Yeah. Sumner's gonna get these orders around 2:30 in the afternoon. He'll start to move pretty quickly across those makeshift bridges. Now it's fun. One of these bridges, these temporary deals, is gonna fall. See you later. Gone. Yeah. It's just gonna fall apart. Okay. There's only one bridge left. That's that grapevine bridge we talked about, but it's on its last legs. You can imagine, right? Um, Bob Sumner, he's a Boston guy, you know, so you know he's going to go for yep. it. They call him Bullhead Sumner. Um, he's not going to bridge stop him. Um, did you know Sumner's daughter, by the way, was married to um, an aide to Robert E. Lee? Armour said really? Lindsay Long. Yeah. So it's funny how these guys are all kind of what was her name? Sexual thing. Well, he, I don't know what her name was, but his name was Armistead um, okay. Lindsay Long. That was his name. Um, so that's pretty cool. And he was an aide to Robert E. Lee and he married somebody's daughter. So it's a weird, weird world. Wow. You know? um, but you know, Sumner has that quote when he's he's crossing the, the grapevine bridge. Someone says him it's it's impossible to cross this bridge, General. And he says, Impossible, 
Sir, I tell you, I will cross as I am ordered. It is not impossible. Yeah, Howard talks about that in his memoirs. Yeah, how they, like, oh, they how they were just like, all right, let's go across, whatever. You know, but they did. They did get over. And yep. he's, he's going to manage to get eight thousand of his guys in that second division under John Sedgwick to set up a Darius couch and secure that position. Now Sedgwick is going to set up his three brigades under William Gorman, William Burns, and Napoleon Dynamite Dana on Couch's <laughs> left. Okay, I love that movie. <laughs> but, but he's got so he's got eight thousand guys now. Now. On the rebel side, Joseph E. Johnson doesn't know this. He thinks he's fighting the remains of whatever Couch has left. Right? He has some cannon. Yeah. Okay, they got cannon. He's not aware that Sumner's men, his that that corps, have arrived, and he was fighting eight thousand plus fresh troops. And so, what is he going to keep doing? He's going to keep sending and in whiting into the meat grinder over and over and over again. Yeah. And they're going to be pounds up by the 12th Union, uh, 12 Union cannon from Battery I of the 1st U.S. Artillery under Evan Kirby, you know, the cousin of Confederate General Evan Kirby Smith. And by 6 p.m., the Rebs with 15 regiments under Whiting, mm -hmm. they're going to keep on coming. Um, they're going to be going with that marshy, swampy field. Now it's been stepped over and it's just people injured and crappy on it. And they're going to take heavy, heavy losses to yep. Sedgwick and Couch's men. Um Brad Joseph uh, J. Johnson Pettigrew Mary. He's going to be up with the 47th Virginia at this point. He'll be shot twice and he'll be bayoneted for his troubles as well. Um, he'll be captured. Obviously, he'll survive to fight another day. Um, Wade Hampton, he'll be shot in the foot while on his horse. He refuses to get off the horse. So the, the oh. doctor has to peel the bullet out of his foot while he's still on the horse. Oh. He, doesn't want to, he doesn't want to get off. Um, <laughs> and with these, with these greater union numbers, Johnson's hopes that he could send Whiting's men to Seven Pines because that's what he wanted to do was yeah. finish up Couch, send them south to Seven Pines, clean up the whole deal. He realizes that that ain't, ain't going to happen, right? No, it's not. And it's around like dusk that Johnston is going to be wounded. Right. And so you know, we, we, we'll talk about him, but his wounding to it, but it's about yeah. seven o'clock in the evening. Yeah. It's going to be hard. Yeah, and he right. gets struck in the right shoulder by a bullet and immediately following a shell fragment hitting him in the chest. You know what's cool about this injury story? I don't know if you know this, Mary. I, I don't know if you say that a lot, but I don't think we really do this. When, when he was being put on the ambulance, Robert E. Lee was there, as mm -hmm. was Jefferson Davis, okay? Yep. And they see him on the ambulance, and they're getting ready to go. And Johnson's pissed. You know why? Because he lost his sword. And this sword was a family heirloom. He's like, I need my friggin' sword. Find my goddamn sword. Oh my God. So, so Lee and Davis would not let the ambulance leave. Now, this guy's bleeding out of his lungs with a shell. And well, he's a got two broken shoulder, ribs okay? as well. He's all, you know, he's all messed up, right? And they have to wait, but they do find the sword. They recover it and they get it back to him. And then he, he rolls off. Nice. So that's, that's how that's going to go. So um, you, it just, it's just, it's funny how people think in these situations what's important at the very moment he probably wanted to make sure he wanted to get buried with it probably i bet <laughs> probably he's more like jesus what have i been hit with i thought there's a buy it back on ebay probably you know <laughs> god but <laughs> but yeah he he gets wounded um and so then that means gustavus smith is going to be in command of the field which in a way how this is unfolding is like shiloh right eight weeks earlier you have the lead commander now. I mean, Albert Sidney Johnson is killed, but you have Joseph E. Johnson getting wounded, and the second in, in command, as we are going to see, is not that no, great. No, but the, the fighting does slow down at night, though. Yeah, and, and this is when you have that every battle it seems you've got troops going out to find the wounded and the dead. Yep. Um, you know, this, this and the, the, these soldiers are going to sleep wherever they can, wherever they find. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lieutenant William Wood of the 19th Virginia, he's going to write, I broke off small pines and piled them up, and I had a superb bed in the midst of the muck and the mud. So he, he made himself a bed. He's very damn proud of it. He talked about it, right? Yeah. And, you know, overnight, too, you know, some of these guys, they're going to be building these fortifications. Mm -hmm. um, more Union artillery is going to be brought over that Grapevine Bridge. Yeah. Um, they were able to get three battalions of, of, of artillery into Fair Oaks overnight. Um and like you said, Gustavus Smith will, will take over on early on the 1st of January, of January, of June, on, a, on around 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. 
And reportedly, he wasn't too happy about it. No, he he was not very happy. He was like, what? He was kind of just, in a way, I think, I mean, Beauregard outwardly was was very confident about it, but but Smith was more like, oh shit. He had this kind of, oh shit moment with it that like, oh my God, what am I going to do now kind of thing, right? Um, but as you said, there's more troops arriving on the battle, on this side of the battlefield, right? And actually one of those troops is, and I got to tell my first big Howard story here because he arrives on the evening, late on the evening of sometime between May 31st, June, June 1st. Um, and he said by that point, a thick mist had set in and Lieutenant Nelson A. Miles, who was part of Howard's command, Howard's on his horse at that point, And he comes up to Howard and says, you need to dismount because there's lots of dead and wounded lying around the field. And no. Howard went on to describe his time on the field. And he said that um, a peculiar feeling crept over me as I put my feet on the soft ground and followed the young officer. A few friends were searching for faces they hoped not to find. There were cries of delirium, cries of helpless, the silence of the slain, and the hum of distant voices in the advancing brigade. And then Howard encounters a wounded soldier from the 5th Mississippi. And Howard asked him how he was doing. How could, how could he help him? And the soldier said he was cold. And Howard said, you have a blanket over you. And then the soldier said, yes, some kind gentleman from Massachusetts spread this blanket over me. But sir, I'm still cold. And Howard, oh. like, I think that kind of, like Howard's reaction was like, oh, my God, like, here's the here's one of our troops helping the enemy in this the uh -huh. fact that that soldier remembered it was clearly they had talked enough that you know this this soldier from mississippi knew that it was a massachusetts soldier that was helping him out and i think like the fact that howard is recounting this years later in his memoirs like tells me that it really stuck with him but uh -huh. um and the fact he you know that that he wrote he's he's writing about it too um but that's what Howard experiences that night when he's walking on the field is all these, he has to get off his horse to lead the horse because there's so many dead and wounded soldiers on the field okay. where he's walking through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And overnight, Gustavo Smith, he knows, I mean, he would rumor has, he had a, somewhat of a kind of a panic attack yep. and he was told he was taken over and breathing into a paper bag probably, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but he knew he had to renew the attack and he, he's under the impression though, because over he just got there, right? He's under the impression yep that the federal troops of Seven Pines are no longer there, okay, because he thought they drove off the field, that's what he heard. So he's gonna want Longstreet um, to leave there and send his troops behind the Union men up at up Fair Oaks, basically come right up there Savannah. That's the plan, right? Yep. And, try, and try to squeeze them in. Now Longstreet is, is gonna complain about the terrain, how difficult it's gonna be to move, I don't wanna go there. And by 6.30 in the morning, he, he, he does end up sending D.H. Hill in a portion of his division towards Fair Oaks. He'll send William Mahone and Louis Armstead, and they'll both hit the federal line at Fair Oaks. Now, when they finally, when they get to this Union line from the south, it'll consist of brigades under Oliver Otis Howard, William French, and yep. Thomas Marr all part of Sumner's core. Okay. Marr is on the picture right now. And do you know what French's nickname was? Oh. Old Blinky. <laughs> because um, apparently he had a weird tick. Some of these nicknames just me. <laughs> they <laughs> called him Old Blinky. And it, it's funny, Sears mentions that. Uh, but Sears also said that French had an, a bit of a bad relationship with alcohol, but it doesn't come through at this battle, apparently. But yeah. Apparently, French's nickname was Old Blinky. Well, that's a good one. That's a good one. I love that. But sp speaking of Old Blinky, you know, what's funny about, uh, about William Frenchbury is um, when the battle gets renewed, something happens where he gets knocked off of his horse, takes mm -hmm. a header right into a mud puddle, face first. All his troops are laughing at him. And he gets all pissed swearing. Well, it's because so he's got this reputation of being drunk, so they probably think he's drunk, right? Well, I think it's nervous laughter. You imagine your boss falls off her chair and lands in a mud puddle and everyone's just laughing. That's what happened <laughs> to this guy, right? And he gets up and I guess, I guess he's swearing, pissed off. Um, and, you know, soon later, Oliver Otis Howard, the Christian, <laughs> Oliver, oh, 
all of Rodas Howard with the, the Christian gentleman with the rock uh, abs and the manly oh, face, as you say. Um, you know, he, 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 I'll let you tell the injury story, but he's going to be injured, yeah. proving, Mary, that he's a mere mortal and not the God that is reported in all throughout Ontario. Oh my God. So anyway, the story of how Howard's injury happens is Howard is brought in by Israel Richardson. And at first his horse is wounded. He has to dismount and wait for another. And Howard notices men retreating and he realizes it's their first time under fire. So he just tells them to lay down and kind of wait. Right. Um, so Howard gets his large gray horse and his brother rides his other horse, which Howard describes as a beautiful zebra. So I was like, wow, does he have a zebra? He calls it a zebra horse. So when I was reading his memoirs, I was like, wow, does he have an actual zebra? So I Googled zebra horse and there's actually such a thing as a Zorse. So side note, I'm wondering if this horse was a Zorse. Um, anyway, anybody listening to this, Google Zorse and you'll find out what I'm talking about. So Anyway, in order to, so what Howard does is he says, in order to encourage the men to move forward, I placed myself in front of the 64th New York and my brother Charles was in front of the 61st New York. And they're actually going to take a lot of prisoners as they move forward. And Howard's brigade is kind of put in piecemeal. They're filling gaps, they're extending lines. Um, but one thing to mention too is leading the 61st is Colonel Charles Francis Barlow. And this is his first time going into battle um, his men are going in to enter a wood where a most violent firing began on both sides. In about three minutes, men were dying and groaning and running about with face shot and arm shot, and it was an awful sight. Um, and it's at this point, Howard gets shot through his, his right arm, and the zebra horse ends up getting killed, and his brother comes over and binds up his arm, and then he runs back to to be at the front of the 61st, which, which Barlow is, is the commander of uh -huh. Howard and his brother crossed the area of seven pines. And there were still union tents there from the day before. These are the ones that you spoke up that had like, you know, all these bullet holes in them. Uh -huh. Howard discovers that there are rebel troops behind these tents and Howard passes to the rear of the line, which is rapidly firing. And his horse ends up having one of his legs broken. And Howard doesn't realize it at the time, but he's also been wounded again through his right arm and a rifle shot had shattered his right elbow. Um, Lieutenant William McIntyre of the 64th New York saw that Howard had been shot and helps him off his horse um, into a sheltered place on the ground and says, General, you shall not be killed. And soon after this, McIntyre is killed, helping his command, like helping his commanding general get into shelter. And Howard says of this, the bullets were raining upon our men who without flinching were firing back. Um, and at this point, Howard calls to Barlow who comes over and I don't know how like he manages to do that in battle, but somehow Barlow comes over and talks to Howard and they decide that Barlow is going to take over part of the command, not all of it. Um, in this, but this is when Oliver Otis Howard gets wounded. Right. He's going to be mentioned he'll be shot a couple times. First time in the yep. wrist, second time it's going to it's going to take his elbow out. Um yep. and you mentioned he's going to turn over command over to Francis Barlow. Um Howard's going to go to the rear where yet another main a surgeon named Gideon Palmer is going to wait and he's going to get there and he's going to say, All right, all right, I'm happy to only lose one arm. Yes. Howard has said to him. They put the chloroform on him, which is ironic that he got injured because he was fighting on a Sunday. He liked to fight on Sundays. Yeah, he, he had hurt. to wait quite a few hours, though, before he got the arm amputated, because apparently the surgeon told him, like, you got to wait until something sets in for it. And Howard's like, all right, <laughs> I got to wait. He's, Howard will, will be put to sleep. He'll wake up and his arm is going to be in the pile. Unfortunately, like so many yep. soldiers, unfortunately. Right. And there's that famous story where the, the, after the battle, when Howard is going to run into Phil Carney on the way back yep. to Fair Oak Station, when Carney saw Howard's empty sleeve, um, he said to him, said, General, I'm sorry for you, but, but, but you must not mind it. The ladies will not think less of you. Yep. And Howard says, yeah. there is one thing we can do, General. We can, we, we can buy our gloves for each other. 
And, and that's, of course, the, was Carney the, lost his left arm. The, so. the, yeah, and he lost his left arm in Mexico. But the sad thing yep. about this story, too, is that Howard will never see Carney alive again. This is the last time these two will meet. Um, Howard mentions that he knew of Carney at, you know, going into Chantilly. He knew he was there. And, but he'll never see him alive again, nor speak yeah. to him. So that's kind of a sad, like that's, you got to wonder if that story stuck with Howard, you know, when he heard of Carney's death, that's mm-hmm. like, wow, that was the last time I saw oh, yeah. him was when we were laughing. We, at least they were laughing, right? It was. You know, and, it's a happy memory. The, the, you know, the battle keeps, gets going though. It's not done yet. So uh, one more of the Union batteries is going to be dragging more through those swamps. This is going to be under a guy named George Hazard. And the Rebs are going to get pushed back for the most part. And this latest attack was basically repulsed. So by the early afternoon on June 1st, the Rebs had tried that one more repulse, kind of a half-assed attempt, kind of a pillow yep. swing at them. And they were, they were kind of done. The battle ended for the most part uh, on that day. And by the second, the Rebs had pulled back those original lines outside of Richmond. And, you know, by now, you know, the bridges were completely destroyed and the river was, was so small that George McClellan didn't really try to do much. A big surprise. He didn't really try to chase no. him. He just let him go. And he, because he, you know, he wanted to see what was left of his five core. When the battle's over, though, McClellan will actually tour the battlefield. He'll go yes. across the Chickahominy and he's going to write a letter to his wife. Um, yep. And he, he, he writes, I'm sick, I'm sick. I am tired of the sickening sight of the battlefield with its mangled corpses and poor suffering wounded. Victory has no charms for me when purchased at such a cost. So he, um, he, he's not, de- he's not dealing well with the blood. It's going to, it will no. show later battles when they kind of, he tries to kind of. I think that's really, cause he said that the, the, he said that the corpses haunted him. And, you know, the one thing about this that he says is the, the victory. McClellan says that Seven Pines, Fair Oaks, whatever you want to call it, is a victory. In some cases, some like you'll read in some sources, it was a kind of a draw. But, you know, the Union are very, they are successful on the second day. And it's because of the artillery. Right. Um, because of Brady and I think it's Kirby, right? That they they managed to bring their artillery up and they the confederates have no artillery to match it so so yuji is basically driven off the field because it's like fuck, you've got like artillery firing at your your infantry you're, you're not yeah gonna make and, this, it. and a lot of these guns you know there were the new york batteries earlier but yeah. a lot of these guns are brought over, like you mentioned guys like hazard guys like kirby casualties are high on both sides the union's gonna lose yeah. just over five thousand guys the yeah. are gonna lose over six thousand um, it is a union victory. I mean, you mentioned before, people look at it as, in, as inconclusive, but they did drive the ribs off the field. There were high casualty numbers. But what this is going to do, though, is when these armies get back in their camps, and they kind of catch their breath. A lot's going to change on both sides for yep. this battle. Right. Yeah. Robert E. Lee is going to take command of the army in northern Virginia, and he is going to reorganize the army. Completely. Yeah, up to, up, and up to that point, Robert E. Lee was an advisor to uh, Jefferson yep. Davis. He helped set up the coastal offenses around around Richmond and Petersburg. Gustavus Smith, uh, he's he noped. They, they get rid of him. <laughs> he noped the fuck out of right. there. Is like no. Nope. Um, the Army of Northern Virginia is now Robert E. Lee's by no mistake. He has it on the yep. Union side. McClellan is going to take the next three weeks and sit outside of Richmond to rest his guys. Um, and in this Seven Pines and Fair Oaks. It's going to be the last offensive uh, known in this peninsula campaign. This is going to be it. By doing so, McClellan is going to give the initiative to Lee here. Is what he's going to do. Completely. Completely. So it, tur- does. it, it, tur- it turns from McClellan trying to get to Richmond to him stalling now to Lee taking over with his primary goal to get McClellan the F out of here, which is going to be the seven days battles, which is going to start soon later. It's going to be from June 25th to July 1st, 1862. Yep. It's ultimately going to send McClellan packing, literally and figuratively. We're going to see John Pope. We're going to see all the stuff coming later with Second Manassas. But Seven Pines, why it's important? It's it's important strategically because it was the last offensive assault, and it was again affected by the the big issues we talked about: weather and miscommunication. That's yeah. what affected it. But once they this battle was over and they both caught their breath, the armies flip spots. And now you turn to the Confederacy under Lee who's going to put on the offensive card and drive McClellan away. And it's going to set the stage for all those battles in late 1862 going into 1863. 
So if you want to talk about an, an, an important battle that doesn't get a lot of press, it's this one. But yep. it isn't so much because of what happened at the battle, all over Otis Howard's arm notwithstanding there. <laughs> but what it's going to do, it's going to set up the, the future, that next phase of both of these armies, especially for the Confederacy, I believe, especially it, it is. And when you look at like McClellan's speech to his troops that he gives on, on the 2nd of June, he said, you are now face to face with the rebels who are back in their front ca- in front of their capital. The final and decisive battle is planned. Soldiers, I will be with you in this battle and share its dangers with you. And then he wrote his wife and said, one more week and we will have Richmond and I shall be there with the gods blessing this week. That never happens. You know, within 90 days, Lee has driven them from the peninsula. And as you said, you know, this is, you know, within that time, like seven days is going to happen. Second Manassas all these other battles that we have talked about that are going to lead into Antietam in Sept- on September 17th, 1862. That's where this is all going. And that's why right. it's so important to study these battles and look at how one, mm. what happens in one relates to the other and it flows mm. battle to battle to battle. Right. You're not, you're not going to have, no, you're not going to have any of these battles without this. Now, eventually you have to think Johnston was probably going to get replaced um, by Lee I at some point. So. But but his injury, some some people in the South say it was the best shot the Union ever fired was the one that took out Johnston. But it certainly did all these battles, like what you just said, that all came out of this and the rest of 62 was all because of what happens with Seven Pines at Fair Oaks. Yep. Um, you have to give Silas Casey credit for holding out as long as he did. Um, he did the best he could. He really had no chance. If that three-pronged attack had hit the way it was supposed to, this would have been a 10-minute battle, would have been a wrap-up and see you later situation. Mm-hmm. But it didn't, and it was all messed up. Uh, the Union did try to hold on. They did try to reinforce. They actually did win the battle, if you really look at the you know, the logistical parts of it. Well, yeah, the, but, the, you know, that second day, like you, you have to look at Howard and French's troops that they take the most casualties on the, yeah. that day. And high casualties does not mean you're fighting badly it means you're staying in it you well know, right too. a lot a lot of them did come to uh late in that first day when when, when john's like rolling whiting's guys in across his yeah. field over and over and over again written into the teeth of the artillery but the but the, regardless you know it's one that's fun to talk about i think it's important to study this battle mm-hmm. um it's got a lot of interesting people in it that we we found out later on guys like joe like gordon um guys like Pettigrew, there's a lot of future names for the Gettysburg folks who study this. Um, this is kind of where a lot of these guys got their proven ground with their chops. And so yeah. it's fun to study this because because you can see, did Gordon's bravery here, did that affect him at Antietam when he had been shot in the face? Karma. Well, I mean, because you can see how ex- people learn by their experiences and how yeah. one battle relates to the other. And they're all humans and they all learn from their experiences. And I think Seven Pines is an important study because you can really kind of see that nascent beginning of a lot of these guys and what they were going to do later on, which is fun. So I enjoy, yeah, I definitely and, enjoy this one. Me too. And then you have Phil Carney who's riding in there saying like, oh, look, they brought me in to, you know, basically save things again. And he dies a few months later at, at Chantilly, yeah. you know, and he's, he's one that, you know, we'll never know how how far he could have risen in the army of the Potomac. Right. No. But you know, he's one in this battle that only has a few months to live. It's true. We'll, we'll talk more about that stuff. So what's coming up for us, Mary, you know, we have coming up vacation, Mary. We do. We have vacation, but on Woo-hoo. that vacation, we're going to be doing a few different events. So we are going to be, if anybody's in the Gettysburg area on Thursday, May 26th at two 30 in the afternoon, we are going to be doing a meetup at Oak Ridge. We're going to meet at the tower there. So you can park there um, just to hang out a little bit and kind of walk around in that area. Um, that's kind of the, the pre thing that we're doing to our event with John Heckman of the tattooed historian. He is going to be do, doing his tattooed historian presents at the Gary Owen Irish pub, seven o'clock. On May 26th, um, we are going to be his guests on that, which we we're very happy about. So thank you to him. Um, and we are also going to be doing um, addressing Gettysburg is doing a get out of the car tour on uh, Saturday, May 29th. I hope I'm getting that date right. 
at mm -hmm. 10 o'clock in the morning. So we are going to be, we're going to be going on that just as, just to check it out and stuff. So if anybody's in the area, that event is happening as well. There's lots happening in Gettysburg on Memorial day weekend. So just, you know, be sure to check out the different things that are happening there. Yeah, don't forget, we're going to be on Matt's show. On yeah, Saturday. we're going to be on Matt's show on Friday. So check out our uh, Friday and also, afternoon. One of, one of our closest friends, Lisa Samia, will exactly. be doing a yep. book, book signing at the Heritage, I believe 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. So go yep. see her. And I think, Mary, we're going to talk about doing a meet and greet at Four Score on Saturday night. We are, so we'll, yeah, Saturday so, night around so, 7.30. So watch, so watch the spot as we get ready to go. So any, I think we can finish up here. We got, we we're going to take a break next week. And so what's coming up for us down the pike, though? Um, I'm wondering if we need to talk seven pines for our next episode, actually, or not seven pines, also, seven, really? seven days. Oh, okay. Well, for our next episode, <laughs> we'll have to meet about that, but one. that's okay. We'll, we'll figure something out. We'll try to do better next time, Mary, but we'll be okay. So we'll have, we'll have fun with that. All right. So let's jump up. Any final words from you, Fincheru? Well, thank you for bringing it tonight for this episode. You did awesome as always. Thank you for our listeners for um, we wouldn't be here without you for these last 84 episodes. And we hope to see some of y'all at our events in Gettysburg that we're doing. Um, be nice to meet up with y'all and have a drink or something, but there's Funko Mary. Do, I'm sure Funko, maybe Funko Mary might be coming along too. Oh God, we can only hope. But if we are going, <laughs> if we are going to Gettysburg, certainly try to drive safe, get down there, see if you can't hope to run into some people down to have a great time and have a lot of laughs. And um, like we said, all opinions are welcome. So Mary, any final words from you? Nope. I'm, as usual, I agree with everybody. So I'm going to jump off right now. So uh, everybody have a great rest of the week. Have a great weekend. Um, hope to see you with down and down in uh, Gettysburg way here next weekend. If you don't uh, have a great safe Memorial Day uh, and we will uh, catch up with you, Mary, soon. And everybody else will catch up with you all on the other side. See y'all later. Peace. Hoot. Do 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 do